Okay, welcome everyone to our monthly pro organic speakers meeting. And today our topic is feed your garden, feed yourself. Our speaker is Rudy Aguilar from the Belize Botanic Gardens. I would imagine a lot of people that would be on this call would know you personally or know of you since you've been at the gardens for quite a long time and have done lots of classes. My husband and I yeah. took a crafting class from you. I will never forget. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Hi there. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Rudy Aguilar. I've been with the gardeners for about uh, 17 years or so. Um, I recently uh, won, won the the Marsh Award, which is a global award uh, in education at at the so, uh, you know, in September, I'll, I will receive that award in Melbourne, Australia. So I will be traveling to Australia to, to receive the award. And it's, it's, it's a global award. It's the first time the East has ever uh, won that award. So honored to, to represent um, Belize Botanic Gardens and the guys that worked along with me, uh, both prior and present. And all of them made a, a huge impact on, on who I am and what I know today. So I want to thank everyone uh, that, that had something to do with these botanic gardens, either in the starting uh, founders, Judy and Ken Deploy. Um, we couldn't do it without them. So thank you, everyone, for that. All right. Um, for this topic, I will be talking a bit about uh, feeding your garden. Um, uh, feeding itself, you know, and, and by by that, you know, it's 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 that it, it is exactly what it says right there. What you feed your garden is what you get back, and I'm, I think it's it's really important to to feed your garden. A lot of the times, we forget that we just try to receive and receive and receive from our, our garden, but we forget to give back, and I. I'm, this is one of the things I try to fertilize, fertilize. Um, we can over fertilize if we do it too much. Um, so if we have a schedule, we have a plan, uh, that is what I encourage everyone to follow. And then to try to do it uh, const constantly. You know, if you set a three week plan, uh, a three week fertilizing cycle, and try to follow that. And um, don't um, slack on it. All right. I have a PowerPoint presentation. I don't know if. Um, I should start sharing that PowerPoint right now. Yes, yes. Let's see, let me see. Share screen. Uh, it's my first time uh, on a meeting. This I usually have Zoom meetings with 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 the found, one of the founder of the garden and and still my boss Judy Deploy. Um, she's in the U.S., so I, this is how we meet. Most of the time, but it's just between me and her, so we try to figure out uh, the stuff ourselves, and it's it takes a little bit long, so just bear with me. All right. Um, um, what is fertilizer, or what is organic fertilizers? Um, well, organic fertilizers or fertilizer in general are materials that, uh, whether it's synthetic or organic, that add some sort of it. it they are super, super important. Um, so um, fertilizers is definitely one of the things that I am uh, passionate about and like talking about. Um, and uh, in my expertise, I do organic fertilizers, all right? And um, we'll be looking at a few organic fertilizers and ways to apply them in, in this presentation. <laughs> All right. Uh, fertilizers usually would have what you call mac macronutrients. So usually when you fertilize, um, 
want to go, you go into the shop or you go into the into the uh, garden store, and you notice that it has three numbers. Um, in in some cases, it's 18, 18, 18, 15, 14, 15, um, 9, 0, 1. So what do these represent? Um, so most fertilizers, alpha, alpha fertilizers, should have a, a little bit one of those um, macronutrients, all right? So um, that is one of the things that, that actually makes a, a fertilizer a fertilizer is if it has one of those macronutrients um, organic fertilizers um, well it has a bit more than just macronutrients all right organic fertilizers actually uh, um, has micronutrients so with the upper cobalt and so forth all right so with with uh, chemical fertilizer, you you will be only getting the macronutrients, and uh, with organic fertilizers, now you get the macronutrients plus the micronutrients. All right, so that's what that's a big difference when it comes to um, organic fertilizers versus uh, chemical fertilizer. Um, I forgot to mention that um, if you have any questions, um, we would. I, I would suggest you raise your hand and um, we will uh, give you a chance to and answer your question as the presentation goes by. Um, reason is because maybe at the ending of the presentation, we might not have enough time to discuss questions. And just so to, if just you have any questions. Yeah, just to let everyone um, know. You um, can put it in, in the chat. Or you can also under um, reactions, you can click on reactions, which on mine is down at the bottom and it has raise hand. And then that will show up beside your name with a little raised hand. And then Rudy can call on you and we'll lower the hand. So that's another way you can get his attention like that. All right, um, uh, we are getting a little bit of rain right where we are. Uh, resume. Have to have, would have to have um, one of these macronutrients present, either nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Now we will be looking at organic fertilizers only, and we'll be talking a little bit as to what are the benefits and how to apply these fertilizers um, to our plants. All right, and um, like I said, when it comes to fertilizing, you want to develop a schedule. You want to do either a biweekly, a monthly, uh, bimonthly, depending on what your plant requires. Now. Um, a lot of people, one of the question is, is it, do I, you know, if I fertilize it more, do I get more fruits? Actually, if you over fertilize your plant, you will end up damaging your plant and uh, sometimes even, even killing it. All right. So uh, the more fertilizer doesn't mean that you're going to get um, more fruits. Um, if you fertilize your plants properly, then you're going to get the best results um, uh, possible, all right? So it doesn't mean that just because you do organic fertilizers, it doesn't mean that you won't, uh, you can't over fertilize a plant, all right? You can still over fertilize plants. So uh, just keep in mind that you will need to, um, you will need to have a, a scheduled fertilizing uh, plan, all right? Um, and you try to rotate also the fertilizers that we're gonna discuss. You try to rotate them so that um, every biweekly or so the plant is getting a different fertilizer, all right? Uh, as much fertilizers available to you, you wanna rotate all those fertilizers, all right? Good.
the release time. Now, um, another reason why we like organic fertilizers is the release time. Um, when we do chemical fertilizers, is is basically um, salts. So as soon as they get wet, they are released into the and the plants are ready to absorb. All right. Uh, and these salts, most of most of the time, what they do is they burn all these macro and microorganisms in the soil, and they are then they are present to the plant. The plant absorbs it, but as soon as they absorb it, there is no more uh, underground because the rest would leach off or wash away with the rains, all right? So when it comes to organic products, when it comes to organic fertilizers, the release time is very slow. And that is why we, we like organic fertilizers because organic fertilizers release it from within one to four months. So it's telling you that within a four month period, you won't have, you won't, there's no need to fertilize using that same fertilizer again. So I personally do it every two months. So if I apply manure to a plant, if I apply compost to a plant, in two to three months time, I would reapply that compost. Again, you don't need to do it anytime sooner because the compost, because the manure does take, they take um, a lot of time to kind of uh, release those nutrients into the soil, all right? Um, the nutrients are released from these fertilizers into the soil. The microorganisms would eat these nutrients and pass them and then they're accessible to the plant. So there is a process that still has to go, the, the, these uh, fertilizers have to go through in order for um, the plants to absorb it. Also, the moisture, moisture in the soil, if it's too dry or if it's too cold, it does affect um, how quick the fertilizer or the plant can absorb these fertilizers. And that is why a lot of plants don't really like the cold, uh, they don't do well in the cold and, and, and they don't do well in deserts either because um, the moisture and the temperature does affect the consumption of these nutrients from these fertilizers, all right? So that's another thing that you have to look at is are, are the plants in their adequate um, conditions? Are they in their adequate environment? And if they are, then they should be they should be able to absorb these fertilizers um, in, in the right manner and in the in the correct uh, timing and also uh, these uh, give you the best fruiting possible. Um, application: How do you apply these fertilizers? Well, there are many ways um, you can you can apply them. Some you dust them on. Um, some you can mix them into your soil mix, uh, and that is what I I I rather doing with with the soil, is incorporate the fertilizers from the time I'm mixing my soil. I never use only soil, um, and I know there's a lot of uh, uh, people out there that that love black soil because they say black soil is the richest or has is the best. Oil and it, that is not correct um, because uh, there's a lot of uh, black soil that are clay and you don't want to have black clay. That's one of the worst soil to work with. Um, so what I do with, with my soil before I plant anything in it is I mix fertilizers. I try to make some um, uh, aeration, that give it some aeration by mixing some, some sun in it, um, wood chip, my rice soils, if I have rice soils, I try to mix all those stuff together along with the topsoil in order for me to get a maximum result, all right? But if I'm growing seedlings, then I don't need to add any fertilizers because the seedlings already have their uh, nutrients in on the cotyledons that they're gonna use. So fertilizing uh, seeds is just a waste of fertilizer. You don't want to uh, use any fertilizers while germinating seeds, all right? So um, application, like I said, you can dust them on, you can water them, you can use it uh, via irrigation. You can dilute it into water and apply it to the plant. And in, in, in teas, that is what we normally do. And when I say tea, it's, it's, a, it's a plant tea, a fertilizer tea. So for example, um, when we get compost, my favorite way to use compost is mixing it together with the soil and also using it as a tea. What we do is we get a crocker sack 
and we put about a pound of compost in it and we would suspend it in a bucket of water and we would add three, three to four ounces of molasses and we stir. We stir it twice a day in the morning, in the afternoon. Uh, you stir it for about five minutes each, each time you stir. And in the, in the third day, then you can take that compost tea and you can apply it to your plants directly. Now you can use it as a concentrate and apply it directly, or you can dilute it with water and apply it to the plants. So there are a few ways you can do uh, the teas. Um, and other, other, other ways I've seen people work with teas is that they would take the leaves directly from the plant and uh, make a tea out of it, either by boiling the leaves and then wait, wait till it's cool and then applying to the plant. Um, or what they do is they sun the, the leaves. So they take it out to the sun in a bucket of water and they leave it out there for, the, uh, for a day and then they um, apply it to the, to the plants like that. And then it, that is the way you make teas as well, right? So, um, so um, one of the most popular teas uh, is made like that. Take the mango leaves, just soak them in water. You can sun, you can sun it, and the tea that you get from it, you apply it to your plants, and that's really, really healthy. Um, another one is grass. People would cut grass and soak it in water, put it in a bucket out in the sun, soak it in water, and apply that tea to your plant. And those are really good. Um, for example, the madre cacao and the mangoes really good with. Uh, with phosphorus and potassium, and the grass are really good with nitrogen. So um, those things you can actually make by sunning out and have the day after, and you can apply to those to the plant immediately after a day. Whereas compost tea, that will take three days to make, right? And I know I'm I'm going a bit fast. Um, let let me see if I can get a a, a plug in. My battery is going a little bit low, so um. We'll see if we can get to a plug in and um, we'll continue. Sorry. Uh, yeah. This is good for 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 a fertilizer in in general. Uh, for any plant, it doesn't really have to. Uh, and be for only mangoes and um, this goes for flowering plants fruit trees vegetables all these all these fertilizers we're going to be talking today can be applied to any plant including your lawn if, if if you want you know but i'm sure you don't want to be growing lawn in this time of the, of <laughs> that we are in you want to be growing something to eat all right so um all the fertilizer we're going to talk about um, will be fertilizers that um, that you can apply to anything. It's not only um, to to a certain plant or a certain fruit tree. I'm talking, and the presentation I've done, I'm talking general. Um, so um, we'll be looking at applying to any plant you desire. Okay. Any other question? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, um, you talked about the uh, the compost tea. Yes. And I was wondering, uh, somebody else wanted to know too, the amount of molasses and what size um, bucket are you talking about? A, a five gallon uh, a, bucket? A five gallon bucket. Okay. A five gallon and, bucket. And, and then how much uh, compost? One, one pound of compost. And so for a five be, gallon for a five gallon bucket, we use a pound of compost and we use two ounces of molasses. Two ounces of molasses. When we say compost, are you talking about composted compost or fresh it, compost? It's a broken down compost. It's not uh, broken down. Okay. You, compost is the end result, all right? The humus that you get. Right. Okay. Um, you, nothing uh, in this will be you. We were talking about raw. For example, we'll be talking about manures and it's going to be composted manures. It's not going to be raw manure, all right? Um, because if you apply raw manure to any plant, you're going to kill it, all right? And then I'm going to be the one with the fault, <laughs> all right? So 
Um, yeah, everything we're going to talk about is going to be finished material already. Yes, any other question? All right. Um, if we don't have any more questions, then we continue. Yes. Yes. All right. Perfect. Um, so, like I was saying, is you can apply it as a compost as a foliar feed. You can dust the the fertilizers uh, on the plant themselves, or you can um, insert it via irrigation. Now, personally, I don't really support. Um, like overhead irrigation systems. Um, the reason why is because I think, um, because of, you know, with, with the experience I have working in nurseries for a fairly long time is that over, overhead irrigation systems kind of waste water. Um, they don't kind of waste water, they waste water actually. So I would do it um, directly on the plant themselves. You go, there is this attachment that I can that I usually purchase at a farmer's trading center called the Venturi Venturi attachment, and it's and it's a little small hose attachment that allows you to pump fertilizer, liquid fertilizer, from a bucket into your hose, and you can water with that um, with that um, little attachment. You can water your plants and diluting it with fertilizer, liquid fertilizer and uh, water your plants with it so that little um, attachment is what i purchased i think it goes for like 15 belize dollars and um, you, you you like i said we buy it at the farmer's trading center in special and uh, that is what i use the fertilizer if i have a like for example if i have a nursery to fertilizer a huge area to fertilizer i use that little attachment if not i take a cup and a bucket and i water those plants directly uh you know um, directly with um with a cup you know no no uh over irrigation systems because like i said in my point of view they they use a lot of water or the wastewater all right um major benefits of organic fertilizer and i and i talked about this already is that they work really slow and so none of the nutrients that they possess is wasted. So unlike uh, chemical fertilizers where the plant is just boosted up and whatever the plant doesn't take up, it leaches into the soil and into rivers and into waters. With the organic fertilizer, it releases in a slow, slow uh, uh, process. So it gives the plant enough time to absorb all the nutrients that the fertilizer itself releases, all right? Um, Organic fertilizers do improve the soil tilt. Um, and what is soil tilt um, is the hardiness or the toughness of the soil. So in, in the area we are, um, Belize Botanic Gardens, it was a cattle pasture. So that is one of the biggest uh, issues we have when planting is that the soil is really, really compact. So what do we do to aerate it? One, we do double digging or we we practice double digging beds and you can look up that process uh, it's a pretty, pretty tedious process of preparing a planting bed but it's a process that you prepare it once for the lifespan of the bed you don't need to till it anymore all right so once you've um, applied organic fertilizers to your soil on a on a on a monthly basis or so uh, you will improve the quality of your soil or the tilt of your soil or the softness of your soil. It will, it will be easier for the roots of those plants to find their way through the ground, all right? Um, another thing is that they would help, um, the organic fertilizers help the water, uh, water retention or help the soil retain water. And it's because of that, it, because it, it improves the tilt in the soil, it allows the water to penetrate that soil a lot easier. All right, because of those organic fertilizers, you get uh, macroorganisms such as, such as earthworms uh, coming back and forth to the top of the, uh, of the, of the ground layer or the, or the top soil. And do, they create um, channels or holes or you know, little airways for water to go in, air to go in, and therefore making the soil um, porous or, or, or you know, a little bit loose. 
So organic fertilizers do help with that as well. All right. Organic fertilizers also increase the bacterial and fungal activity in the soil. And, and you know, a lot of people might say, well, bacterial, bacterial is not good for plants. Well, a lot of bacteria actually are pretty good for plants. In order for, for plants to survive, bacterial and fungal activity need to be present in the soil. Um, there is this funga, fungus called mycelium, or it's, it's basically um, the mother of all fungi. And a mycelium it has to be present um, in order for all these microorganisms to work. And um, that is one of the things that scientists are looking at is do plants communicate via mycelium? But that's another topic for some other time. All right. But um, fungal and bacterial activity need to be present in the soil, along with micro and macroorganisms in other form, um, the, the, the soil to absorb, the plants to absorb all these nutrients. All right. Organic fertilizer is a carbon-based compound, so it usually uh, increase the productivity and growth and quality of plants. Um, so uh, because it's you know, biodegradable, because um, they are slowly penetrating into the ground, the plants get all the time enough, or have all the time enough to consume all these good nutrients, all right? Um, one, of the, one of the things I, I look at when I'm, when I'm farming or planting organically is the cost. And um, Belize Botanic Garden doesn't have a lot of money to be purchasing uh, very expensive fertilizers. So cost is important for us. Organic fertilizers are one of the cheapest fertilizers out there. Now we purchase our fertilizers from a place in Tea Kessel called Hope Fertilizer. Hope Organic Fertilizer. That's the name of the place. It's based in Tea Kettle. Um, it was once run by Mike Benetti. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the name Mike Benetti, but he was the one who have been preparing a lot of our um, organic fertilizers for, for us, including the collection of bat guano. And we'll, we'll step into that farther down, all right? So cost is also important when you're dealing with organics and, 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 and the and the funny part is that even though organic fertilizers are cheaper, organic products, organic fruits, organic vegetables are a little bit more expensive uh, out in the market. And um, that is something that uh, we should look at and see, you know, it does take more work. It does take a lot of um, observation and a lot of knowledge, um, but let's make it competitive. Uh, let's make the prices competitive. So to allow people to choose healthier. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why people don't choose healthier is because uh, of prices. For example, a pack of ramen, ramen noodle, would cost you a dollar. It, would, it can feed about two or three kids from that pack of ramen. Whereas if you go and try to buy a sweet pepper for $2 a pound, uh, you can only buy that sweet pepper. You cannot buy a complete meal. So those are things that Belize Botanic Garden have looked at. And we are trying to, to, to come up with ways or equip people or educate them in growing organic. It doesn't cost much to grow organic. You can grow all your food organically and, and at, a, at a pretty low cost, all right? So that is one of the initiatives we are actually taking on at the moment is teaching families how to grow organic in their backyard. And um, we are working with 15 families uh, presently. And, and uh, we, we want to we take it uh, countrywide, but again, everything costs. So we want to see if we can land some grants to do so. All right. So that is what we are looking at the moment. Um, organic fertilizers also contain more uh, minerals than chemical fertilizers. Uh, chemical, like I said earlier, would be based on three main um, mic uh, uh, macro fertilizers, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, whereas organic fertilizers would contain up to 13 minerals, which would include the macro and the micronutrients, all right? Um, organic fertilizers are easily biodegradable and non-toxic, so they don't cause any um, environmental pollution. And that's, that's the main aim of the garden is, how can we um, reduce 
the damage we've done on Mother Earth? How can we help uh, with the with the with the all this um, uh, leaching, fertilizer leaching? You know, how can we um, equip the the public with the knowledge enough to grow vegetables in a healthy manner uh, without using um, chemical fertilizers? All right. Now, because of time, we'll just rush. Well, not rush, but I'll, I'll take my time and explain. But uh, we'll try to, I'll try to move fast through these slides. Like I said, if there is any question, please, um, whenever this slide is going on, uh, just voice your question and we'll get to them. If there are any questions now, I'll, I'll, um, I can answer. Um, is there any questions? Jiddy? Nope, don't see any right now. Nope, okay. So these are the list of organic fertilizers that we have worked with in the past. And um, that uh, not all, I can't say all the time they are uh, readily available to us, but most of the time we can find here and there. And once you find a source, I mean, if you have like a, a crocker sack, a uh, hundred pound of either of these fertilizers, it will, you will see that it will last you for a very long time if you apply it constantly, but little, all right? Little by little, applying it to the plant um, you know, on a constant basis. You will, you will have these fertilizers for up to three years if, if, if you have 100 pounds uh, of that. Well, at least for Botanic, Belize Botanic Garden, that's our experience, all right? We don't need a lot of these uh, fertilizers to apply to the plant. Like I said, we apply it on our soil mix and on a monthly basis or so, we give the plant a little bit of each one of these if we have it. Um, most of the ones that are, are easier to get for us would be the composted manure, uh, the fish meal, uh, the rock powder, the seaweed, uh, bat guano, which is both uh, high in nitrogen and high in, in, in phosphorus. Uh, and um, uh, for us, bone meal also very easy to get. In some cases, you can get the feather meal and, and the fish powder, um, compost and manure, all right? Compost and manure, we make, we, we make our own. We, we do our own compost. We have a horse and we try to work with, with that horse uh, manure and also our compost. We get it from all the greens and browns that we collect from the garden. So this is a list that we... Uh, I've, I've put up um, of some of the uh, compost of some of the fertilizers we work with, and I have a little explanation on each one. And you do have a raised hand. Okay. Okay, I just was wondering uh, how long do you age the manure before it's usable? Uh, how long do we age your manure before it's usable? We try to focus on it. Um, and, and, and by focus on it, I mean, uh, we try, we compost it. So we run it similar to a compost. We pile it up and we turn it. Um, once we pile it up and it, it drops, it takes about three weeks to drop. And then you start turning it. Um, every, every five days you turn it. Um, so within two months, you should have soil or compost already. All right. So it shouldn't resemble anything like manure in two months. If you uh, turn it uh, and you do it on a constant basis, you cover it and you have something underneath so all the nutrients don't drain out. Because a lot of times we just pile it up and leave it out in the open and that's not the proper way to do it. The rain comes and all the nutrients from within that manure have leached out. Um, the roots of trees will find that pile of manure because they are rich in nutrients. The roots of trees will find that pile and they will drain out the nutrients you are trying to store. So by the time you're ready to use your composted manure, it has nothing left in it, all right? So you need to have something on the bottom and you need to cover it with something so that it, it keeps away from the rainfall and it keeps away from the, the, the roots coming up from the ground, all right? So within two months or so, you should have composted manure if you look after it. If you just pile it up and leave it to the elements, then it takes about six to eight months. And there's another question from Samsung. Go ahead and ask it. Yes. Well, 
with the problem with sargassum right now, would sargassum be considered a seaweed? And how would you prep that to use it as a fertilizer? Okay, sargassum, in recent, recently they have been noticing that sargassum actually has um, mercury and um, some metals that are not healthy for, for, for us to consume. And, um, and um, that would be in, in huge amount though. So if you want to compost sargassum, then um, if you do it in small applications, then it's okay. Um, huge applications, then you'll have a problem. Um, we were trying to work with, with, um, with San Pedro, uh, one of the big um, resorts there. They were talking to us about creating a compost pile of sargassum. Now, we were going to go there. We went, actually went there and do, did an assessment on, on how much they get and how we can actually do it. But um, you know the planning all didn't didn't go didn't go well. So um, we, we thought that they weren't serious enough for us to travel to San Pedro on our tight budget. You know, so we, we dropped it. But um, it is an issue, and um, I I know that um, in order for you to use sargassum as or, or try to compost sargassum, first you need to wash off the salt. So you need to soak it at least 24 to 48 hours and get those salts out before you can um, either make a tea out of it or, or compost it if, if you want to, you know. Um, but um, it does increase, it does improve soil texture and um, you, you can also use it a bit as a mulch. But again, in, in heavy quantities, it's still being studied. And um, the recent studies said uh, it has a little bit of, of, of um, some uh, uh, what do you call it? metals that you, you don't want to consume, right? Um, did I answer the question? You did, thank you. All right, all right, perfect. Um, all right, we will we, we step right into uh, rock fertilizers or rock dust, uh, or powder, rock minerals, or rock flour. Uh, and this we usually, again, we get from Mike Benetti. And the, usually the rocks that are being used would, would be um, igneous rocks. Those are the, the, the richer ones, igneous rocks. And also uh, dolomite. Uh, and, uh, um, the, the poorest one would be limestone, even though they're still a little bit, for example, white lime is used a lot um, as, as a pest deterrent. So even though it's not used as a fertilizer per se, it can help you get rid of some of the pests. Again, lightly, apl uh, light applications needed. You don't need to um, pour a lot of these uh, fertilizers around your plant. Now, if the fertilizer accidentally falls on the leaf of your plant, you don't need to worry because these organic fertilizers won't, won't burn the leaf of the plant like the salt fertilizers would. Now, I'll further down, I'll be talking about manures. That's a little bit different. Um, but for now, rock, rock fertilizers, um, you can apply it uh, dry or you can dust it around the plant or you can soak it in water. Again, you put it in a crocker sack. Again, we use a, about a pound to a five gallon bucket. We, we do the same procedure as we did the compost tea. You take a pound, you put it in a crocker sack, you uh, drop it in a bucket you don't let it touch the bottom so you tie it up to something you tie it up with a string and you let it float there for about three days you add molasses and you stir it and you have, you can apply it to your plants like in that way as well all right the thing with the rock fertilizers is that it does um release its nutrients really really slowly so for us what we normally do is we mix the rock fertilizers with our compost so while we are composting, we would apply rock fertilizers in the compost. We don't do it, um, uh, we don't uh, powder it around the plant. You can, like I said earlier, but the way we do it, we think that it works better composting it with your compost, all right? So that is where we would apply our rock dust fertilizers. All right, rock fertilizers are environmentally friendly, friendly, sorry, they're non-pollutant. Um, 
again, they are inorganic. And people will say, oh, we thought we were talking about organic. You know, inorganic simply means it doesn't break down. So it, it, it's like sun, it stays. You know, sun is inorganic as well. So that is what rock fertilizer basically is, is, is a dust from rocks. So even when they say, well, how does, how come the plant absorb it? Well, what happened to this dust is that uh, the micro and macro organisms will, will eat it up. And as they poop, they would make it small enough for these plants to take up. And that's what happens with the rock fertilizers, all right? Uh, so those microbes will have to work in order for you to get the nutrients of the rock fertilizers into your plants. And it's with everything um, these microbes have to work. And that's the thing with, with salt fertilizers that instead of encouraging these microbes to come and work for you in your garden, it chases and kills them away. It, you know, it chases them away or kills them. So it takes them a while for these, for these areas to develop those micro and macro organisms again. So instead of killing them or chasing them away, you want these, these little microorganisms to work for you. How do they work for you? If you feed them and give them water, all right? How do, they, how do you feed them and give them water? With these organic fertilizers uh, that we are talking about, all right? So th that is the beauty about uh, farming or, or, or doing your, your um, garden with organic fertilizers is that you encourage microorganisms to work for you and then by feeding them, all right? And these microorganisms will allow your plant to be stronger and these microorganisms will allow your soil to be richer, all right? So that's it for rock fertilizers. The other one would be cottonseed meal. Now with cottonseed meal, you have to be aware of where you're getting your cottonseed from. Now what is cottonseed meal? It's basically either crushed powdered um, cotton seed, all right? Easy as that, all right? Where are you getting your cotton seed? Are you growing your own cotton seed? If you are growing your own cotton seed and making your own um, cotton seed meal, then that would be ideal, all right? Because that get, then you know exactly where that cotton seed is coming from because you don't want to be doing organic fertilizers, but using plants that have been grown with chemical fertilizers as well as uh, pesticides and herbicides as well. So that that will that is like um, putting a, a, a biodegradable straw inside a plastic pack. All right, um, and we don't want that. All right. So just make sure that you know where your cotton seed meal is coming from. And very similar with the soybean. Soybean, most soybean is is uh, GMO. All right, so make sure that you know where your soybean is coming from. And if you notice the NPK of soybean is 721. What is 721? Earlier I explained that 721 is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So it's telling me that I have seven nitrogen, I have two phosphorus, and I have one potassium, which is telling me that soybean meal is very rich in nitrogen, it's a nitrogen-based fertilizer. So you gotta know what you're gonna use nitrogen-based fertilizers for, all right? Um, nitrogen-based fertilizers is used for the greenery or the leafage on your plants. So if you want your plants to look green and leafy and big, you gotta give it nitrogen-based fertili nitrogen fertilizers, all right? Which soybean is pretty good or pretty rich in nitrogen. All right, the other one is bat guano or bat feces. Um, you know, and bat guano is harvested from caves. And like I, like I said earlier, we have a guy from um, there in tea kettle and he collects the bat guano and he would sell it. I think it goes for $20 for a, a 50 pound bag. So a 50 pound bag should last you a pretty long time. Um, I would say approximately two years, um, depending on how much you are farming or how much you're growing for sure. All right. And again, the bad guano, you can easily apply it into your soil mix. You can either make it into a tea and you can, the tea you can apply via 
either to the roots or you can place, spray it uh, on a flow layer, as a whole layer feed, all right? And the bat guano that is high in nitrogen are from bat that eat fruits or the fruit bats. So the fruit bats will have the manure um, of those bats will be really rich in nitrogen, all right? And why I say fruit bats is because they also have the vampire bats. Now the vampire bats, the, 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 the feces of the vampire bats, they will have more phosphorus in them than it would nitrogen, all right? So even though it has a little bit of nitrogen, like you see here down below, uh, even though it has a little bit of nitrogen, the phosphorus is larger. So 10 out of uh, uh, 3, 10, 1, 3 being nitrogen, 10 being phosphorus, and 1 being potassium, um, it's showing that it, it is pretty high in uh, phosphorus, all right? So this is from bats that are vampire bats, all right? And again, you can do it the same way. If you have worked with bat guano before, you will see, you will know that it's, it's basically powder. All right. So whenever you are handling all these fertilizer, please make sure to wear a mask. All right. Mask and gloves are really necessary for this. Now, it's not because they're going to harm your body, but because these, um, these fertilizers might have bacterial, fungal, uh, might have micro and macroorganisms that you don't see that can cause you harm um, if, if, if there's an infestation with, with the bats, all right? So a mask and gloves is important when you're dealing with these kind of manures. One of the, one of the, uh, let me see, let me see. One of the, the ones that people don't really like to work with and it's, and, it's, and it's actually pretty good is the blood meal. And blood meal is basically dry blood turning, you know, they turn the, the powder form, they turn dry blood into part of, you're not gonna take, uh, you know, a, 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 a chicken or a whatever and put the blood in a cup and just pour it in your, in your, in your plant. That's not how it works, all right? You will attract ants and all that stuff uh, to your to your garden, you don't want to be doing that. Uh, what you want to do is you want to put it out to dry and and then turn scrape it off, turn it into the powder form, and then apply it to your plant, or you can apply it to your compost. Again, we try to do it in our compost so that it doesn't affect uh, the the plant more. Try to break it up a lot more. If you notice, the blood meal is really really high in nitrogen base so it's a really high nitrogen based fertilizer when it comes to blood meal and again it's not something that you'll find uh, people using a lot all right even though it has a lot of nitrogen people won't be using it a lot uh, similar to here human here human here has a lot of nitrogen but people you don't see people using the fertilizers the human here a lot even though you can you can mix it the human here in your soil mix and it will be perfectly fine. So if you get a haircut or you go to the barber shop, you collect some of their hair that they have and you can mix it into your soil and that's, and that's fine. You don't have to get a huge bag of, of, of it. Um, a little bit would do. One of the ones I work with the most is bone meal. And, um, and bone meal is, 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 is pretty accessible. Again, the, one, the ones that produce uh, produce our bone meal is hope organic fertilizers from tea kettle um, they have an office based uh, in in Belmopan and they also uh, have their place in in tea kettle where they process all this stuff all right and the bone meal and um, if you look up videos on on youtube on how to make bone meal from from your chicken bone or you know but whatever bones you have uh, accessible to you or you, are, you know you can get then you can see it's fairly easy you, you boil the bones you put them out to dry and you crush them into a powder form uh, you, you can crush them using a pestle and a murder and once you get a pound of that that is enough to deal with um, at least uh, well, you know three uh, meters square so you can easily fertilize two big beds 
with a pound of the bone meal, right? You don't need a lot. And if you look at bone meal, uh, the NPK in bone meal, uh, the phosphorus is pretty high in that. And the release time for the bone meal is one to four months. So after four months, then you would reapply bone meal again, all right? So it does take a long time before you would have to reapply. So twice a year, if you apply bone meal to the plant, that's pretty good. Okay, the other one that we work with is a feather meal. And it's simply very similar to, to the way we do um, bone meal. You know, uh, you want to crush it, you want to cook it and then crush it and get some of those nitrogen into the soil. Again, feather meal is very rich in nitrogen, similar to your hair. And um, you can fix that into the soil and it works. And then for those people who have chickens, chicken coops, this is an excellent way to get rid of your feathers. You get a lot of feathers around your, your coop. Uh, you can incorporate it into your compost. You can uh, make a meal or, or cook it and, and crush it and apply it to your plants. And it should, um, it should um, help it with the nitrogen that it needs, all right? Again, feather meal is not something common that you'll find. The other one is fish meal. And fish meal recently started to get popular when Belize started to work with tilapia. So the tilapia farming helped a lot um, with the fish meal fertilizer. And uh, there was a lot of tilapias, you know, there were a lot of um, ponds that people were thinning out or getting some of the tilapias out. They were overcrowding of, of tilapia. So one of the things they would do is fish meal, all right? Um, they would make fish meal out of it and sell it um, as a fertilizer. And um, if you notice again, um, it has pretty high uh, concentrate of nitrogen and also um, pretty high concentrate of phosphorus. It has very little potassium, but it does have the three of them uh, present in that uh, fish meal. So it's, it's really good for your plants. Again, if you can have that, then that's something that you should um, apply to your plants. And if, if you find someone that um, is producing these fertilizers and you notice and you try them and they're, they're, they're working great for your plant, then share the information, uh, share the contact numbers. Um, I'm sure the poor organic group or this group, you know, you can share it here, get, it, get the information out there so we can help these um, at home uh, fertilizer makers to, to start expanding their business, all right? Now, we, we, we step into one of the most common, and uh, what in my, in my uh, expertise, one of the most uh, complicated ones, manures. Now, I've seen manures used in many different ways. I've seen manures, different type of manures used as well. Now, straight out the back, I'm telling you, we at the gardens do not use uh, dog manure or cat manure. So dog and cat manure are out. They don't want to be working with dog and cat manure. Um, the, the, the reason why is because these manures have high content, content of amoebas. I don't want to be working with these um, uh, manures that carry pathogens and can actually get you sick, all right? So we don't want to be composting um, cat or dog manure, all right? Um, another thing is, um, what are the animals eating? You know, a lot of the times I get farmers telling me, well, Rudy, I do, I grow organic, okay? What do you use? I use chicken manure, okay? Where do you get your manure from? Oh, I get it from a uh, Spanish lookout. Now, Spanish lookout, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the, 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 the chicken um, places in Spanish lookout do have hormones fed or, in, you know, given to their chickens. Now, these hormones end up, uh, or these uh, boosters end up in their manures. So if you take that and feed it to your plant, you are feeding that as well, all right? So that is not really organic. So 
you got to know where your manure is coming from. Um, free rain animals are the best. All right. Again, the same thing with your horse. Are they injecting your horse with, uh, with steroids? All of that information you need to know. Where is the manure coming from? Um, who is providing it? Or what's the care of the animal um, when you get these manures? And uh, if you have your own, then perfect. You know exactly what they are getting. So you, are know, you, know, you would know whether the manure is good to eat or not. All right? Well, not good to eat, but good to use as a fertilizer. Um, so um, we have also seen people use sheep and goat manure, and it's, it's good rabbit manure as well. If you have, you will want to compost that um, again. And the composting, how long does it take? Um, it varies. It varies on, on, the, on the humidity. It varies on the material that the animal is eating as well, all right? For example, horse and cow manure are the easiest one to compost. Um, they would take about a month and a half to two months for you to get a finished compost if you do it properly. Where when it comes to sheep manure, rabbit manure, it takes a little bit longer and it's because they are in these tight pellets uh, that takes a little bit longer to decompose, all right? Um, but um, um, they do make really good manures as well. You can also use manures to feed your, your California red worms. And we'll talk about California red worms a little bit further down because that is also a mean of fertilizer, uh, getting fertilizer. Um, so that is what we actually do with some of our, um, our manures is we collect it and we feed our California red worms just um, horse manure. And we take that California red worm casting or the, the humus that it produces, and we use it and make tea out of it. All right, it is a beautiful, uh, it has a beautiful texture, very, very soft, grainy. And um, we, use, we use it, we take out the tea, we make tea and we take out all those nutrients out and the bagasse or the leftover, we mix it into our soil. So we don't waste any of it. All right, and um, that is what, that is actually one of our best fertilizers that we have is the castings of worm. And we'll talk about that a little bit further down, but manures is what we have to feed them. We, we use horse and cow manure to feed the worms. Now, a lot of people talk to me about chicken manure and the application of chicken manure. I would strongly recommend you don't use chicken manure if you haven't yet experienced how to use it or haven't worked with anyone who has taught you how to use it, all right? Have someone teach you how to use chicken manure before you go ahead and give it a go because more than likely you're gonna lose plants if you go ahead and use chicken manure. Chicken manure is pretty strong, even though it has been composted already. And um, I, I know one of my, my coworkers, he was telling me that he composted this chicken manure for two years. And he went ahead and did a nice little mulch around one of his guava he bought from us. Now the guava is a bit pricey. And he did, he did a nice little mulch around the guava. About two feet away from the base of the guava, he did like, a, like a, an inch or two inch mulch around it. A couple of days later, his plant was dead. It was too much, too much application of manure. And even though the manure is broken down already, chicken manure is super strong. Um, so you don't want to be applying um, chicken manure in huge quantities to your plant, even though it has already broken down, all right? So with manures, it's, it's, it's quite a huge um, vast of manures you can choose from to do your, 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 your compost or your fertilizer from. But then again, you got to know how to reapply it and make sure that um, you're not hurting your, your plants with it, all right? And with the case, uh, with the case I'm talking about is chicken manure. Um, the others are a little bit lighter you can use, but again, like I said, the ones we focus on the most is uh, cow and horse. Compost, all right, compost. Now, a lot of people don't see compost, um, especially people who work with uh, chemical fertilizers. These people don't see compost as a real fertilizer. 
And one of the reasons might be is because you can't really measure how much nutrients compost have. Uh, in, the way I, I, I would explain it is, it's because it has too much nutrients. Compost is your friend. Compost is your best friend. If you're go, doing an organic garden, you have to have a compost, all right? Um, I think that this is one of the ways that for, for a lot of the problems that come up in, 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 in planting, uh, the reason is because there's not uh, enough compost or there's no compost at all, all right? To improve the soil compost, to, so for soil mix compost, uh, to, improve, to improve aeration so, uh, in the soil compost, to, to apply fertilizer compost, to, as a mulch compost. You know, compost is used so much uh, in our garden that we cannot keep up with the production of, of compost. And we get compost from different things. We can make compost out of bananas, uh, banana stalks, and that compost will be rich in uh, potassium, all right? You can make compost out of grass, and that compost is going to be rich in nitrogen. Or you can make compost out of food scraps, your leftover foods, and that compost is going to be rich in all the nutrients you can think about. It's going to more or less have a balanced nutrient. So compost is one of the things that definitely every household should know how to do and should have one, all right? A properly managed compost is a beauty to watch or to use as well and to use as well. All right. The last one we're going to look at is vermicompost. All right. Now, what is vermiculture or vermicompost? Um, vermicompost is basically the, the, is the use of, of California red worms uh, and to make humus or to make compost. What you do is you feed them. You feed, what do you feed them with? Any organic matter. So you could feed them with your leftover food. You could feed them with manures. Um, you could feed them even with cardboard and they will break it down for you. Now, the ones that we use here in Belize is California red worms. They eat 10 times their body size and they will reproduce really fast as well. Central Farm usually sells the California red worms for, I don't know, I think it's $22 for the cup. And you don't need, you don't need a lot. Um, they reproduce really, really quick and fast. So in a couple of weeks, you're going to have to be dividing these worms and making more boxes for these worms. Now, if you are working with California red worms, you got to look out for birds eating your worms. You got to look out for ants getting into your box and you make sure you have constant food supply for these worms, all right? If you know how to manage all these things well, you will have one of the best, one of the richest um, uh, organic fertilizers out there, all right? So we have been managing uh, California red worm for quite some time and we try to keep it within a box. Uh, we don't, if they get too much or if they propagate and they get a little bit uh, higher, we take a handful and we apply it or we throw it in one of the beds and let them go into their, the ground like that, all right? If you have chickens, you can feed the chickens with it. Uh, if you have fish, you can feed the fish with it. Um, so all these things you can do with the extra California red worms if your box gets overpopulated, all right? But again, you can purchase the California red worms in Central Farm. They do uh, sell it there and you can watch their, you can see their setup that they have um, there as well. Um, and uh, they have one of the best setup. Uh, you, and you don't need nothing fancy, nothing big. Uh, a small box would do a, probably a two by two, a box two by two with uh, a good six inches uh, in height. That should do the trick for California red worms. Make sure it has a cover because the worms love the darkness. Uh, so they will work whenever the cover is on. And again, that keeps the birds away from the the worms themselves. So they shouldn't be exposed to any, the rain, they shouldn't be exposed to the sun. So in a cool, dry place uh, with fresh manure, you let, let them go in there and have their, their, their feast. It will take about three weeks before that manure is turned into humus. And then you replace the manure and you use that 
that you must, or you can bag it up. If you don't need it right away, you can bag it up and store it for future uh, use, all right? So that is the, all the, com the, the fertilizers I have uh, for you guys uh, on, on, on this session. What's that? And there is a question. Uh, yes. Um, um, Mary is asking if we can add rice oils to vermicompost. Now, rice oils are, are, are carbon-based, and they would, they would definitely eat some of it, but you don't want to do only rice oils, all right? For example, I said you can feed the, the vermicompost or the worms, you can feed them cardboard, but you don't want to feed them only cardboard. There needs to be something with moisture in there. For example, manures, like horse manure, chicken manure, not chicken manure, sorry, horse manure, cow manure, or sheep manure, rabbit manure. Those manures have to be in there along with, if you have some leftover vegetables or, or, or you know, leftover tortillas or stuff like that, you, you break it up and you incorporate it in there um, and, and the worms will have a go at that, all right? Um, if you put any oils, if you put any pepper or anything like that, uh, it will affect the, the worms and you could end up killing your worms. No oils, no pepper. Um, no chemicals, uh, no plastics, all right, um, when you're dealing with vermiculture. Yes? Yes, I have a question about the, uh, you said for the compost, you can use banana peels and whatnot. We have a lot of banana trees and uh, also plantain. plantain. When the bunches are ripe and we take them off the tree, can you use the, the, the trunk of the plant as well and chop it up and throw it in the compost heap? Yeah, sorry, sorry. When I was saying bananas, I meant, you know, all those musa species, plantains, bananas, blogos, apple bananas. And I was talking about the stock. Yes, the stock and the leaves, not the fruit themselves. I mean, you want to eat your fruit, I don't, I don't expect you to compass your fruit. Um, I, I'm, I was talking about the stalk. I was talking about the leaves. You chop them up into little pieces. Now you will see that these, these uh, stalks would have re really, it will have a lot of water, right? A lot of water content. So um, nitrogen or the greens, you have to monitor the browns as well. So compost are, is made whenever you have a good ratio between greens and browns, all right? Wets and dry. Now the wet ones would be the banana stock. Now the dry ones can be uh, dried up leaf or, or wood chips, you know? I don't recommend for you to do a uh, pine wood because it has the oil. So if you have a, a, a chipper, you can run some leaves, through, dry leaves through the chipper and you put 70% of those brown leaves along with 30% of those banana stalks, and you can get an excellent compost as a result. The smaller the particles or the smaller the pieces in a compost, the faster the compost breaks down. Just keep that in mind. Yes, any other question? I see Robin and I see Samsung. Yes, Robin. Yes, hi there, Rudy. Um, I just had a question about making compost. Yes. Um, we came we came originally from the UK and we always had compost bins. And, yeah. And I've, I've also worked in Africa where we used to just dig a huge hole in the ground and uh, make the compost in the ground. Yes, so and, and the, you, you can, you can actually... You can actually well if you don't have if you don't have um, a, 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 a way to make a compost bin or a setup above ground, you can easily dig a hole and bury it there. Now, there is a pros and cons to that. Um, a, a pro would be it's easy. Dig a hole, you stick it in there, and you let it decompose. Um, you know, it's, it's easy, easy to do. You can come back a year after or six months after and plant right above that and you can get good results. One of the cons on, on that is that you don't control how much micronutrients or you don't control, control how many nutrients stay there. There's a lot of roots or a lot of plants, especially if you have big trees around you, 
that will be sending their roots in that area and mm. taking some of the nutrients you are making for your vegetable garden if if that be the case now if you are planting uh, an orchard and you uh, want to make i don't know a, a, a one little pit for every plant that's great i mean the plants are going to enjoy that for sure um one of my friends have a a, a chicken a cool bunch and they sell local chicken so sometimes in in the chicken you know the the some of them would would the little chicks would die back so what he does is he would bury them near his his fruit trees and, and that's excellent excellent fertilizer for the trees okay um i was going to say also uh we have uh, grass clippings we have cow manure from our cows and we have wood chips as well because we got a we got a chipper yeah so i mean what else when you're making compost what else should one use well that, anything that that, that anything that actually can break down um you can use um we use leaves we use uh, sticks uh you know we, we run into the chipper of course we use banana stalks we use heliconia stalks we use you know all the weeds that we pick from our garden we use that as well um we use the food so we have we we have a restaurant and all the leftover food we would use it in the compost as well but what you have to remember is that it has to be 30 percent wet or nitrogen or greens and 70 percent browns which is either wood chip or dead leaves all right anything that is green is considered wet or greens anything that is brown like cardboard dry leaves or um, rutted wood those are considered brown so 70 percent browns 30 percent greens uh cover it on top so that the moisture doesn't it doesn't get too wet for example today it's raining here uh we don't want our compost to be exposed to all this rain it will saturate your compost and your compost will start will stop heating up or will stop breaking down all right because okay. what breaks down compost is actually micro microorganisms and if you have them soaked in water they're gonna drown the alley uh, air space is gonna get uh you know they're gonna get choked up uh, there's gonna, not gonna be enough air space for them to survive so your compost will stop working for a while and then uh it will take a few months before it can start working again so to avoid that you want to cover it up and then if it needs water and one of the ways you know it needs water is because ants will be you will find ants in the nest if you find ants in the nest then it means that your compost is too dry um you need to give it a little bit of water with either a hose or a bucket you know sprinkle the water now don't soak it all right okay yeah i, I find the problem here is that the the compost heat gets dry very quickly so we yeah. do have to add a lot of water yeah yeah and I'm, and I'm, and if if you see that's the case then you schedule maybe we turn it every five days and if you notice that your compost is drying up by the fifth day when you turn it then you try to turn it every three days and make sure that you apply water um to the compost whenever it, whenever it's dry all right um, because okay. if, it do, if it doesn't have that moisture then the microorganisms will not work as well so it needs that moisture but not too wet okay and when you when, when you talk about wood chippings and things i guess you have to leave it in a bit of a heat first before you use it in the compost no we use it right away um oh, we, we, okay. yeah we use it right away and it and a, a good a good um a good way to test is that we usually run through the chipper green uh trees and we do rotted trees as well so we have a combination of browns and and greens right there so okay. three or four days later you stick your hand into that pile and you will feel the heat in there that is telling you that the pile is heating up and it's breaking down so you are actually already making compost there all right now if okay. you take that and you incorporate more stuff into it you're simply making your compost um, a, a better healthier compost with more nutrients all right and i'm making it uh, really really good for your plants um uh, and it would, it would break down a lot faster as well and that and those and that the jump start that your uh chip already has will be passed on to the rest making your compost 
only take a little bit time for it to finish uh, breaking down. Okay, so I would I would use seventy percent of the wood chip and then thirty percent of grass and um, grass clippings and you know household. Um, yes, food correct, waste correct. And, and and you'll notice that, for example, if you take your vegetables, leftover vegetables or the vegetable peels, and you put them in a bag, and you will notice that um, when you dump it in like the day or two days after, it's really really juicy, and it, yeah. it's starting to smell. And if you put too much greens in your compost it will get juicy like that and it will stink. So yeah. a good sign that you're not composting well would be the smell in your compost. If you have a, a, a rotten, um, you know, like smells like a fermenting rotten smell in a compost, like a rotted meat, then yeah. it, it, it means that um, your, your browns are too little. You need to increase the browns in order for you to balance that odor and for you to balance that juice. It, there's, there, there shouldn't be any juice coming out of your compost. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right, welcome. Any other question? Rudy, do you or can you put in the chat session or someplace have the contact information for tea kettle? Because we always used like banana um, fertilizers. I, I, can, I, I can probably give it to um, Mary. Okay. And I have her uh, share it with you guys. I have it in my phone. Okay. And um, I can share it with her. And, um, you know, this guy, you give him a call and he would deliver within San Ignacio, Santa Elena area if you, um, if you get a good number of it. Now, for example, we get 10 bags of fertilizer. We are working with 15 families installing. Each family gets a garden bed that is three by 10. Uh, which they can grow approximately 30 different varieties of vegetables on that bed. So we are using 10 bags of um, this fertilizer in a 15 yard truckload of soil. So we're mixing in this fertilizer uh, in that truckload of soil, uh, along with uh, coarse manure, compost, and some uh, uh, cocoa peat that we sell and um, you know all those this good stuff go as well in in our mix all right so uh um i will provide you with um the the contact for this person but you can find him you can find him on facebook under the name hope organic fertilizer what I was the name again hope h-o-p-e oh okay hope organic fertilizer okay perfect that's the only one i found on facebook registered under that name all right thank you all right. Any other questions? Karen, yes. posted a, Karen posted a good comment on in the chat session just to remind people if you use wood chips from lumber plate from a lumber place, make sure that they're not treated. They're not what, sir? Treated wood. Yes. We don't want pine. We don't want treated. Um, and the reason why we don't want pine is because pine contains acid or contains this resin or this oil. And it just ends up damaging your plants a bit more. All right. So you don't want that. Um, there's somebody, Samsung SMP6 with the hand up. Yes. Um, you know, I, I know you can't tell me for sure but my my problem is i always get my plants to grow i have great seedlings everything's doing great it gets to a certain stage and then it just kind of quits and i'm not seeing a lot of insect activity okay and i'm wondering if you think it's more of a soil issue okay um it, and there are a few ways you, you can try that out. You can, you can test uh, whether it's the soil or not. Uh, one would be to, to sun your soil. Uh, take your, before you plant anything on it, take your soil, put it in a, in a, in a, on a black tarp or a black plastic, and spread it thin across, and then put it to sun. Leave it in the sun for about um, you know, two days, uh, 20, 24 hours. But you know, from seven to about four or five o'clock in the evening, you leave it in the sun, you put it back in the shade and you do that the following day as well. This will sterilize the soil you have. 
So most pathogens, most fungi, most bacteria that are dangerous to your plant would die during this procedure. Now, after you've done that, you take and you mix because the, the plant, the, the soil is going to be uh, barren. It's not going to have anything in there. You, after you've done that, you take and you put uh, compost, you put um, um, uh, fertilizers in it, organic fertilizers in it. Uh, you mix it thoroughly with a little bit of sand, a little bit of uh, wood chip or uh, rice salts if you have rice salts, and um, and you and you plant your plants in that and see how it goes. All right. Uh, you don't want to, because you you because it sounds like your growing stage is well. It's more of the flowering and the fruiting stage. Try to focus on fertilizers that are high in phosphorus and potassium. Potassium will make your plants strong it will be potassium makes your plant immunity strong the roots are, bit, are strong and uh, which makes your entire plant strong strong to disease and pests so that is what potassium does now phosphorus what it does is helps for fruit and flowers so if you have the fruit and flowers not really coming out um, um, so you would need you would need um, you would need uh, phos phosphorus for that sorry and um, try to focus on those fertilizers. Also give it a little bit of nitrogen, but not as much because it sounds like you have quite a bit of nitrogen already. And, and I've heard from many, many people, and again, they may not know, they all tell me the same thing. Plant in containers, plant in raised beds, don't plant directly in the ground because it's much more difficult. What's your attitude on that? Um, if, if, if you are feeding your, your plants properly and if, if you are taking time to, you know, and, and looking after your plant, observation is key. It doesn't matter exactly where you have it. As long as you are there with your plant looking to see what's going on, your plants should do well either in container or in the ground. We personally use raised beds. Um, now, the reason why we don't do containers is because, well, we do a bit, but not as much is because container plants require double the attention than plants that are planted in, in, in the ground. You know, you need double the fertilizer, you need double the water. And we try to focus on water conservation, uh, try to focus on the conservation of water. So that's the reason why we don't go into container planting because we have the um, we have the, the 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 available area to plant outside in the ground. So we go for that instead. You know? But if we didn't have in the occasion that um, you don't have a, a a yard, then I would encourage you to, to do container planting for sure. But if you have a yard, then um, it sh it should be no problem for you to grow unless you are right on the beach. Okay, one last question. Oh, sure. Um, in terms of where we live, which is Toledo, and we, we grow, trying to grow, our, of course, not native, which is our fault. But do you recommend using a hoop house or some sort of system to control the amount of rain, such as tomatoes and peppers are getting? Um, a raised bed does control the, 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 the um, yeah. drainage of the soil. So if you have a raised bed, even though you get a lot of rainfall, it's going to drain off. It's not going to stay. It's not going to settle on your bed, you know? Um, so, and also if you, if, if you, if you experience that you're getting too much rain, then you should uh, put some, some sort of cover on it. Um, uh, whether it's construction plastic or whether it's cool leaves, but some, something to control the, the huge amount of rainfall. I mean, uh, the first 15 minutes of rain, is essential for the plants. You know, you need to have them absorb that water. Uh, even indoor plants, I would take out and have them soak, give them a good soak. But after, if it continues, it continues to rain for about two, three days straight, then that's too much. You don't, you don't want your plants to be sitting out there and uh, soaking all that water. Okay, thank you. Welcome. I think we are experiencing a low battery again, so uh, we just have few more, a little bit more time. 
Okay, does anybody have any other questions for Rudy? Yes, please. No other questions. No other questions. We'll... All right, uh, battery is right, right on us. It just gave us a message saying that it's pretty low. Okay. Um, so if there is no questions, and thank you very much for for uh, for your thank attention. Thank you very much. And, um, thank you, Rudy. Very it good. An, it was an honor to, to to be here. I know I've I've been um, trying to get on on um, on this for a while with you guys, and um, you know either I'm busy or you know recently we we, we had a little setback with um, the founder of the garden, Judy Deploy. Um, you know, she she's in the U.S. getting some medical treatment, so I'm the one responsible for the gardens and then, and then also for this course that we have going, where we're helping 15 families with doing backyard gardens so that so as to relieve some of the um, spending on on food. Food. So so um, that's what we are we are doing at the moment. Um, uh, a bit busy, but we like we like being busy. We like uh, sharing the information we have. Thank you. Well, congratulations on your award, Rudy. Thank you very much, uh, John. Thank, Thank you very much. Hold on. Okay, if there's nothing else, then we will wrap it up for the day. And All right. Okay. Thank you so very much, Rudy. All we right. really appreciate all the information. Thank you. Thank you as well. Thanks, Rudy. Thank all right. Bye. Okay, we will say have a pleasant evening to everyone.